So welcome everyone to Let's Imagine 2021. Um, we started this as part of the Imagine Awards where the Imagine Awards were created with three missions in mind. First of all, to shine a light on the nonprofit sector uh, and provide recognition to a sector that does so much for everybody else, uh, but never really gets the uh, recognition it deserves. Uh, and it's amazing the amount that, uh, and the energy that the nonprofit sector creates on a, uh, here on Long Island on a, on a daily basis. Second, because we felt if we could bring Long Island leadership together um, to foster increased collaboration, that would be great for the sector as a whole. And third, education. Uh, everybody needs to be um, really uh, continue to learn. We all learn from each other. And that's really what today is all about, just an opportunity for people to ask questions of an amazing panel of, of individuals. You know, we're talking about, you know, um, four of the five winners of the 2021 Imagine Awards. You know, unfortunately, today, the Long Island Against Domestic Violence winner of the Flushing Bank Innovation Award was unable to be here. But we do have four uh, tremendous leaders with us today. We have Heather Ed Edwards, Executive Director of Allied Foundation winner of the Vanguard Insurance Rising Star Award. We have John Kemp, uh, CEO of the Viscardi Center, winner of the Tillman Ballin Leadership Award. Uh, we have Stephen Long, Executive Director of the Children's Museum of the East End, winner of the Claire Friedlander Foundation Arts and Culture Award. And last but not least, we have Peter Elkowitz, CEO of the Long Island Housing Partnership, who was the winner of the Serenian Associates Social Impact Award. So welcome everyone. Um, again, as I said, these are some of the most effective nonprofit leaders out there today on, on Long Island, uh, if in, and actually anywhere. If anybody has any questions as we're going through this, this is your opportunity to chime in and ask questions. Um, just uh, post your questions through the Q&A and uh, we'll get them asked. Um, so let's get started. Uh, maybe if uh, we can spend a minute each talking a little bit about your organization um, and what you do as a nonprofit organization. So Peter, since you're at the top of my screen, why don't we start with you? Sure. Uh, since the inception in 1988, over 33 years ago, the mission of the Long Island Housing Partnership has been to provide affordable housing opportunities to those who, through the ordinary unaided operation of the marketplace, would be unable to secure a decent or safe home uh, or remain in a decent and safe home. Uh, we do that through uh, various uh, priorities. One is acting as a not-for-profit developer to build affordable housing or rehabbing affordable housing on Long Island. One is through what we call technical assistance to municipalities, community-based not-for-profits, and for-profit developers uh, to help them facilitate the creation of affordable housing. Uh, we also provide education to the clients to, for pre-purchase mortgage counseling, post-purchase counseling, default and foreclosure counseling, and fair housing counseling. Um, we advocate uh, at a federal, state, and local government level to improve the affordable housing policies. And actually, we are a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, so we help not-for-profit sectors on innovative community lending. We are a Disaster Relief Corporation and a Community Land Trust Corporation. Uh, LIHP assists about 2,500 individuals and families a year throughout its various programs. The question is, what don't you do? That probably would have been a shorter answer. <laughs> so, Steve, you want to uh, talk a little bit about what you guys do on the East End? Related to um, the Children's Museum of the East End is located in Bridgehampton. Our mission <laughs> is to spark imagination and foster learning for children of all backgrounds and abilities and to build strong connections across the East End community by providing playful experiences. But we're really more than a museum. Uh, in some respects, we're kind of like a, a settlement house. And uh, that's because we're, we're not just providing playful experiences, we're really in, in, in many ways looking after the, the nutritional, the uh, recreational, the emotional, educational needs of families here on the East End. So uh, one, one of the ways we're also doing that is kind of expanding out. Um, we're, we're working on a satellite location in uh, Riverside, which is right near Riverhead in the town of Southampton. And our, our goal is to try to meet the needs of as many um, families here in Eastern Long Island as possible. So it's really a holistic approach to serve. Cool. Heather? 
Hey, thank you so much for having us. Um, Allied Foundation was founded by pediatricians of Allied Physicians Group who made it their life's work to take care of babies and families. They formed, um, they, they saw that there was a lack of access to basic needs for families who were struggling financially, and they really came together to do something about it. We formed the Allied Diaper Bank um, to provide diapers free of charge to families who cannot afford them. And we do that across Long Island and our impact has been significant. And that's because um, there is no safe haven for families when they run out of diapers. They can't use SNAP, they can't use WIC, they can't use Medicaid. So when they run out of money for diapers, they have to take it from other areas or they have to reuse their diapers and keep them on for longer periods of time. When you're a parent, that's a really hard thing to do when you can't provide for your baby. So we provide um, basic needs because they're not just basic, they're essential. And during the pandemic, we expanded our programs. Um, we now uh, offer a period supplies because that too is another item that's not covered by any government assistance. So if you are low income and you run out of period supplies, you have to come up with other options and that's that shouldn't be. Um, basics aren't basics, they're essential. And we stay focused um, on our mission to improve the health and well-being of people in the community. Great, awesome. And John? Good morning, Ken, and good morning, colleagues and everyone tuned in. I just want to say thank you for having us on, Ken, and uh, it's a real privilege to be with all of you. The Viscardi Center is one of three corporations, nonprofit corporations that we operate here, and we operate under the pillars of education, employment, empowerment, and equity. And we've added that fourth E because of the tremendous attention that equity is getting right now in the DEI movement. And we feel that it, it not only applies to our staff, to our students and adults who get services, but to everything that we do in our community, all the contractors and the like. But we educate uh, a number of children, about 175 medically fragile children with severe disabilities who can, who can engage in the general curriculum. They come from all the boroughs uh, and from Nassau and Suffolk County and Westchester County. So we have quite a catchment area. 86% of the graduates go to college. These are nonverbal power wheelchair using students who are incredible and people underestimate them all the time. And they have a hard time once they get into college and out of college. Employment is another big area uh, where we've only had a 1% gain in employment since the passage of the ADA 31 years ago. And so we created a National Center on Disability Entrepreneurship to fill that gap. And then empowerment is just making you feel good about yourself and confident that you rightfully belong in society. You're not asking for more, you're just expecting to be treated equally. So it's a fantastic place where we serve about 2000 people a year. Okay, well, <clears throat> based on those introductions, you can tell why these individuals and these organizations were best in class and winners of the uh, past Long Island Imagine Awards. Um, what factors do you think are critical to your and your agency's success? Uh, Heather, you want to start there? Sure. Um, for us, it's really all about having a plan. That's sort of our roadmap for what we're going to achieve. And we sort of evaluate that pretty much on a, a bi-monthly basis to see where we're at. We take a look at our programs, what's working, what can be scaled, what needs to be changed, how can we do better we collaborate um, with diaper banks across the nation. We're one of 220 diaper banks in the United States. So we collaborate together on how we can best um, improve our efforts, improve our warehousing, our supplying, and really how we can make the biggest impact. Um, the other thing is that we do stay focused. A lot of people say, do you do baby cribs? Do you do baby clothing? And we're like, no, we stay focused so that we can achieve our mission and have the biggest impact possible across Long Island. And lastly, we act. Um, we don't just talk about it and write it on paper, we actually do it. And I think that's probably one of the most important things because when families need help and we are a lifeline for them, we have to make it happen by whatever means necessary. Yeah, I mean, that's important. I mean, I think a lot of agencies, they. Um, get involved in one thing and then they have a, a certain level of mission creep and it kind of maybe detracts from their uh, core mission. So it's great to hear that you're kind of laser focused on what it is you do. John, you want to jump in? 
Certainly, um, much like Heather, <clears throat> I would say program relevancy is constantly reviewed. Uh, we're constantly asking our parents and our program participants of all ages, is what we're doing meaningful to you and are you getting something from it? And we try to measure that in every way possible. When we're not relevant, we're going to be out of business. Um, so the, the needs change periodically and we have to kind of flex and move with them. At the same time, we're paid by the state for much of our services uh, and we have to meet their needs as well. So program relevancy, um, continuous improvement, uh, hiring the very best staff we can afford to hire. That's probably the most critical issue is, is staffing and then getting the volunteer leadership, the board leadership that resonates with our mission and engages. So those are the factors that I look at constantly. Steve? Not having an edifice complex. Okay. Basically, we every uh, so many uh, arts and cultural organizations, the focus is how do we get people to come to our place, come to have seats in our theater, come to uh, visit exhibits in our museum, uh, or whatever it might be. And I think that the key to our success is that a museum isn't just a place, it's a it's a good neighbor and how do we develop ways that we're going out into the community and that we're, we're giving as good as we get. And so um, if, if we focus on that as a, a concept that we're not just a, a place trying to attract people to come to see us, but we're making uh, the same kind of effort to go out and learn about uh, what the needs of children and families are in our community, uh, we're going to be successful. Great. Peter? Sure. Uh, what John said is very critical uh, earlier, that the staff is really important. Our staff believe in the mission. Therefore, they work hard as a team. Uh, the most valuable asset in, in any organization usually is your staffing. They can either do an excellent job or, or they can ruin your reputation if they, if they so choose. But the bottom line is when we uh, review staff, we want to make sure they believe in the core mission at the partnership. Um, because the, from the person who answers the phone to those who run the programs, to the financial staff, the IT staff, and senior management overseeing it, they all need to work together as a team. And I think that's one of the pluses here at the Legal and Island Housing Partnership. Uh, the old saying, remember, uh, you are as strong as the weakest link in, in your chain is very true. So everyone needs to pull pull their weight and, and, and run their areas. Uh, no one person is the top important person, okay? And the other thing I wanna say is it's a little what Heather and Ken said is stay focused on your mission. It's very easy as a not-for-profit that you want to deviate uh, a little outside of your mission because someone needs a favor or a help, but you need to really focus and make sure it, it, it supports the mission that, that you were originally set up for. One of the things that um... Peter, both you and John brought up, you brought up the whole staffing component of things. And I know in today's marketplace, staffing has been a little difficult. And, and it's not just, you know, staffing in terms of employees, but it's also staffing and leadership within the governance and the board. Um, what have you guys been doing in order to uh, attract and retain in today's tough marketplace, you know, effective employees, effective leadership? Who wants to take that one? So I mean, I'll, I'll start off if you want. We 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 listen to our employees. Uh, we make sure that you know through the whole pandemic that we reached out to all of them to make sure that they knew that we were you know we cared. We wanted to see if they had any issues and in, in operating remotely. Uh, that word gets around, uh, and obviously you know, we we increased our staff from twenty eight to almost forty uh, during the pandemic, and that's onboarding and and making sure that they were comfortable coming on to uh, the new role here at the partnership. So as long as you know they realize you're there for them uh, at, at the top level, it's important for them to hear from you and to communicate and stay communicating through, through the whole process. But it's, you know, after that, you know, word of mouth gets out, you know, uh, so if you're not, if you're not a decent person, I think to your staff and you don't recognize the importance of it, but the person who answers the phone is the first person, first point of contact in the organization. So you want to make sure that that person really believes in the mission and is happy in their job, because if they're not, then it affects everyone else right down the line. Anybody else want to add anything to that? 
Yeah, I'll just add that um, Allied Physicians Group has a very strong company culture. They invest a lot in their employees. And even though the foundation is separate and, and we're only a, an employee of one, I did never feel alone. We have a strong group, good people around us, whether it's our physician partners, our board members, um, our employees in home office, we really all come together because we share a common purpose. Um, so I feel like we're very fortunate that we have a lot of people that we can go to when we need assistance or help or perspective. This might be a synthesis of those two responses, Ken. Um, we we focus a lot on telling our executive staff, especially but all of our staff, that they are the most important assets that we have and that their safety and throughout this pandemic has, has been number one. Uh, while we are concerned about our students and, and everybody else who comes in here for services or comes to Viscardi in some way, um, the employees are, are the most important people and making sure that we are taking care of them physically and protecting them from a health standpoint, the, the PPEs, the, uh, all of the equipment that they needed, the screens, the you know, temperature taking, we just jumped into it full force. It actually brought our management team together in a remote manner. It brought all of us together and we started really connecting very closely with each other in ways that we wouldn't do if, even if we're physically you know, back in the building. Uh, that led us to include our three board chairs in a bi-weekly, every other week, Friday morning meeting with the executive staff to not only inform them about COVID and what we were doing to address all the needs of COVID, but to talk to them about the top level issues that we were dealing with, not asking for their approval, just engaging them in the discussion so that they would realize that they're part of our problem solving. They own these issues just as much as the staff and they're ultimately responsible for the outcomes. So it, it actually brought us together in a tighter bond. Nice. Steve, anything to add or? I, I just would reiterate the, you know, the importance of listening to the staff. One of the uh, you know, most important uh, things that we've been doing during the, when we were closed to the public was running food pantry. Uh, that was an idea that was suggested by a staff member who was really in touch with um, a, a lot of our low income families that use the museum. Uh, another, uh, staff member suggested a, a very innovative way of um, making it safe for uh, visitors to come to the museum where they weren't uh, you know, having families kind of crammed together. How do we separate, uh, keep, keep families socially distant? Um, that was another um, uh, idea that was suggested by a staff member. I, I think when staff, as the, the others were saying, feel invested and are seeing their uh, ideas borne out and and used by the organization. It, it's it's galvanizing and it's it's inspiring and it and it it, it builds its own momentum. Can I add, can I add something to what Steve just said? Because I bring up the food pantry. It, we have one here as well, but the hard part is for people, employees, to say they need help, especially with food, and to have food insecurity, and and they and they their dignity is on the line. And so we really are careful about how we create the opportunity to have food that employees donate, canned goods and other, other items that they can use, but how people can come, receive the food and, and leave with dignity. On the, a lot of us take for granted how fortunate we are. And there are other people who have different, very, very different circumstances and they have to come and ask for help. These are your employees and my employees, and we have to treat them with great dignity and care. All right, I'm gonna kind of change the focus a second here. I mean, uh, there's been several conversations or several parts of answers which talked about innovation, which talked about being proactive and, and, and um, being nimble. Um, you know, so when we kind of think of the nonprofit sector today, probably more than ever before, you know, that whole entrepreneurial spirit, the need to be a little more uh, innovative in the process, especially going through the pandemic and having to really reinvent yourself as an organization. Um, how do you guys stay proactive in your approach to running your agency? 
Um, Steve, you want to start with that? I think it, I, I mean, for us, it's, it's looking for strategic partnerships. Uh, one of the, the, I mean, one of the, the great uh, parts of the Imagine Awards is the way that it educates you about what other nonprofit organizations are doing here on Long Island. And uh, we have so many ways that we can uh, partner and inter intersect and help each other do what we're doing better. Um, you know, one, one of the things that, uh, you know, for example, there's uh, uh, the, the retreat here in uh, Eastern mm -hmm. Long Island, um, uh, and they needed a space for job skills training. Uh, they needed a classroom. The, the, the biggest challenge that they were facing to getting families to participate in the job skills training was that uh, and the retreat helps families affected by domestic violence. Uh, they didn't have any uh, thing for kids to do, uh, the, the children of, the, of the, the parents who were participating in the training. So they approached us, would we provide the children's programming while the parents were taking the job skills training? It just was such a, a amazing way for the Children's Museum to advance learning through play with uh, uh, an audience that often we don't, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have access to the museum. And it enabled the retreat to advance their mission of helping break the cycle of violence by getting um, you know, primarily women back into the, 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 the workforce. So um, I, I think any, the only way we find find ways to do that is if we go out into our communities and we meet with other nonprofit leaders, other community representatives, and and find out, you know, what's going on. How can we use, you know, what what we do, our mission, our resources, to collaborate with uh, others and and help them, you know, add value to what they're doing as well. That's really cool. It's it's kind of building the fabric of the sector, and that's that's really really exciting. John, you want to jump in? Sure. I, I think the uh, idea of innovation and, and entrepreneurship is in, internal as, as much as it is external. And I think about the process barriers that build up over time for a, a maturing organization. <clears throat> and it's really a, a problem. It can be a real problem setting up, well, you've got to go here to get this approval and over here. And then you got to get to the board and the board's got layers of approvals and all of a sudden it takes you six months to get anything done. You're like, forget it. You know, like let's, let's streamline this thing. This is not the way business would operate. Uh, the idea would come and go and somebody else would have it. So we have tried very hard to streamline the decision-making and to empower staff to take greater risks, knowing that failure is always going to be a part of everybody's job. Doing it two or three times in a row, that might be a little bit of a problem. But, you know, do it once. It's OK. You got to try things. You got to you got to. And you have to have the confidence and the empowerment from the from the boss and the, and the and supervisors to try things. If we don't try and change up programs a little bit, they're going to become irrelevant. And and, and, and I think we're going to lose staff. So I really think people are entrepreneurs inherently and they want to try and, and they want to be rewarded or at least recognized for their their spirit. That's cool. So you're giving people the opportunity to uh, try and fail, which is hopefully not fail, hopefully succeed, but still. Um, right. Again, I think that's important. Peter? Sure. Uh, I, we always uh, try to stay ahead of the curve. So we follow what's happening, uh, not only locally, but nationally, statewide, and local uh, is important with similar organizations. Uh, we make sure that we include the staff in because uh, a lot of times, since we work in different areas within the organization, whether you're a counselor or you're a developer, uh, we try to bring them together to keep them as updated on what's happening nationally because they're involved in a lot of training sessions as well and bring it back to the organization and, and inform and educate the staff what's happening in their industry. Uh, we, from the day one, I was always taught to treat your organization like a business, look for opportunities where you can bring in more revenue uh, so that way you can assist more people. And as Steve said, it's always looking at different partnerships that may be out there. Uh, we look at ways to improve the staff role and responsibility. It goes back to listening to what staff may bring in uh, because they are actually doing the job. So 
you know, they see there's a way to improve it, be flexible at a senior management level, uh, use automation where you can, uh, you know, save the staff time for working with the clients, uh, you know, not for profit to criticize if they're not working with the clients and they're using more automation, but you can use the automation and I'm sure we'll talk about it a little later in areas that could benefit you and, so that you can spend more time with the clients and always keep your eye on the budgets. Um, if you're not uh, generating revenue uh, and the program, it, it's not gonna be around for long. So you wanna make sure that you, you follow the budgets and, and try to see where you can get revenue to support those areas. Heather, you want to talk about uh, innovation entrepreneurship within your organization? Sure. Um, we we stay connected to our community partners. We partner with over 55 nonprofit community organizations, religious organizations across Long Island and even into the boroughs. Um, and, and really, it's about assessing the need, what's happening in the community. Um, we provide diapers pretty much from Montauk all the way into all the boroughs and across Long Island. So we touch a lot of different communities of need and it's about staying connected, seeking their perspective on what they're seeing, what they need, how we can better serve them and how we can improve our efforts to impact more, more people. And, um, and it was interesting through the Imagine Awards, I, I met, I saw Steve, and I went on his website and saw they were doing a baby swap. And I said, wow, I said, maybe this is something where we can be a part of. Um, we'd love to provide diapers if you're going to have moms coming in who are going to be getting cribs and other things. Um, but I, I got to believe that diapers might be, a, might be a positive thing to have. So um, we reached out and we made it happen um, fairly quickly. And uh, they're going to have their event on the 18th. And we're providing diapers. And we also have... Um, through our allied physicians group, we have a new parent helpline, which is a phone where parents can call if they have questions about any, any items related to newborns, and they can uh, get some trusted advice from our pediatricians and staff. And so we included that as well, because I feel like um, if there are moms, there may be questions and they may need resources, and we aim to provide those for families. So I think it's constant collaboration, constant communication, and seeking perspective all the time. So Steve, I have to ask, you had a baby swap. So someone who didn't want their kid anymore, they were going to swap it. <laughs> I, 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 I saw your, uh, your, 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 your <laughs> eyebrow go up a little bit. Baby yeah. gear swap. <laughs> oh, okay. I just wasn't sure. Oh, I forgot the gear. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Minor detail. I, you know, I, I, you know I, I think sometimes we think, oh man, uh, that colicky baby, maybe I'm uh, swapping that uh, in for, for a new model. But no, just... Just the gear. <laughs> so uh, several of you in talking about innovation talked about collaboration. Um, how do you generate or how do you develop those types of relationships? Um, what do you look for in terms of trying to find a good collaborative partner? Who wants to take that one? Um, we, I just asked. I sort of just, you know, I go out and I say, where can we make an impact? What community of need needs service? So I find a nonprofit that's in that town and I say, okay, um, we have diapers. We'd love to work together so that we can get you the diapers and then you can get them to the, the people in the community who need the most. Um, so we're, um, we connected recently with the Red Cross and that was really a function of seeing what's going on in the communities. Um, there was a lot of devastation in the Queens community um, during this last hurricane. And I thought to myself, um, families are being displaced. They have nothing. Um, how do they sort of come back from that? And if we could provide a lifeline and be connected to that, that's something we should do. Um, I reached out to a board member who I knew was on the Red Cross. And I said, I just want to connect with them and see if there's any opportunity for us to collaborate. And then as anything else, we had a Zoom, we connected and, and now we're gonna be working together to really help with disaster relief and providing um, diapers in an immediate sense um, for families who are displaced and need help. So for me, it, it feels like it just becomes a natural extension of the work that we do. And I think you gotta have no fear and you just gotta go out and try. And if for whatever reason, it doesn't work, you move on and, and do something else. I, I would add to what uh, Heather was saying. She also reach, uh, reaches out to our elected officials. Uh, that's one of the ways uh, she and I connected was through our county legislator uh, mm -hmm. here. 
uh, on the South Fork. And I think that if we're in touch with our elected officials on the on the municipal level, the, the county level, the state level, the federal level even, uh, they're folks who really are also very attuned to what's happening in our communities and, and really can be uh, of great assistance in kind of connecting our nonprofit organizations with others that uh, could kind of benefit from joining forces. Okay. I, I would say the same thing. It's an extension of uh, some of our companies. Our community development financial institution provides low interest to affordable housing developments for our developments, but it also benefits other uh, land trusts and not-for-profits when they are developing affordable housing. We can uh, fund and flow through on uh, the community development financial institution at a low interest rate to help them. So we have partnerships there. We also have partnerships when we do the disaster relief program. Since we cover all of Long Island, uh, sometimes you need to be in the community. So we work with community-based not-for-profits so they can do more granular outreach to make sure the systems gets out to the family. So there, there's many ways that not-for-profits can look for partnerships. But again, I think it's based around the mission of the right. organization. So. Yeah. John, you mentioned earlier um, social impact. And social impact has basically been become in essence some somewhat of the currency of nonprofit organizations. If I can show that I'm impactful as an organization, um, that's going to be very, very important in terms of developing collaborations, developing contracts, bringing in resources and everything else. Um, but it's also been somewhat elusive in terms of being able to actually measure impact and how do you uh, measure the impact that you're having as an organization. Um, what have you guys been doing in terms of trying to uh, capture that information, document that information? How do you kind of measure impact within your organizations? And if you can give some ideas to the, the group that are listening, that would be awesome. So John, since you brought up social impact, I'll ask you first. Well, it's a, it's a, <clears throat> you're raising a, a very good issue. You know, the fact that we say we serve almost 2000 children and adults doesn't mean that after they got the service, did they get a higher education? Did they live independently in the community? Did they uh, land a job? How long did they keep the job? So staying in touch and trying to, trying to track that data has been a challenge for the uh, management information systems that we're using and trying to get the feedback loop to tell us what was the outcome that really resulted from our training someone in culinary skills, for example. We have a culinary skills program that every graduate of our eight week program has certification in knife safety and food safety and security. Everybody gets a job, but in the food service industry, everybody stays for six weeks, three months, and then they move to the next job that pays them 50 cents more per hour. So there's incredibly high turnover, but at least they're working. It's the ability to stay connected with the person who graduates and then measure what they're doing that is the hardest for us to be able to do. We do pretty well. We created an alumni association for our school and we get feedback from our 300 or so alumni uh, as they age up 50, 60 years of age uh, as to how they're doing, did they work? Uh, and we have a 50% higher employment rate than, than the general public of people with disabilities because we prepare them for, you're not gonna go home after high school or college and sit on the couch and watch TV for the rest of your life. You're not doing that. You're going to contribute all you have learned and you're gonna help your fellow citizens. So we try to track them. And the hard part is, Ken, after they leave, what happened, where, how do we stay in touch with them Alumni Association was born. And, and just, and I'll give everybody else an opportunity to, opportunity to, but what do you do with the information once you accumulate? How do you use that information to right. better the organization? That's, that's a very good follow-up question because if we don't do anything with it, then what the heck did we capture it for? Um, it is fed back to the management and to the program participants and to parents primarily so that uh, we use it in our marketing, we use it in our program design, uh, in our outreach um, so that we can say, you know, if you come here to get training for a job, you have a 70% likelihood of landing a job that you are may, may or may not want, you know, may, may, you know, you, you may not stay there for a long time, but it will it will result in you getting a job by coming here. Uh, a lot of organizations don't have the data, 
but we've tried very hard to capture that data, feed it back to our marketing and, and feed it back to our funders so that they know that there is investment return uh, and that's important for them, foundations as well. What are other people doing in terms of uh, measuring impact and utilizing the data? So um, I'll just share that um, the data is very important. Um, everybody wants it. They want to know about your impact and they want to know about it on a granular level. Um, we don't really have the ability to do that, but I have been seeking out opportunities to sort of do that for us. Um, the National Diaper Bank Network, of which we are the only Long Island partner, they are embarking on an economic impact study to really assess the impact of diaper banks across the United States. And so we are going to participate in this Herculean effort that's probably going to take six months. But we are participating because I think it's important that Long Island is included in the data because we're going to get the data. And what we're going to do with the data is we're going to work, like Steve said, with our elected officials and advocate for our families on a local, state, federal, and national level, really because there is no safe haven for families when they can't afford diapers. And we need to change that. And the only way that that's gonna change is with data and facts and details. Um, so it's gonna, it's gonna be a four to six month process, but we're gonna participate um, because it's important that Long Island has a, has a voice. And um, we're just thankful that um, the National Diaper Bank is partnering with the University of Connecticut, the School of Business and their economic department to actually really call down the numbers to give us data that we can use to help move things forward. And also really to help for our fundraising efforts and making the case for support and why the work that we do is important. Not just saying that we distributed a million diapers in a year, I mean, yes, that's important. And we impacted 45,000 families, but it's really to have more data to sort of back it up so that um, we can continue to get support and continue to do the work that we're doing. All right, Peter? So in, in housing, it, it, it's long-term a lot of times, and it depends on what we're measuring. But for example, when we construct new homes, you know, are the families remaining in their homes? Are they safe uh, when they do sell or want to find a bigger home, you know, are they gaining equity in the home? Uh, so we track all that information when we develop homes uh, and our technical assistance programs. We look at how many homes are created basically on Long Island and in what, what areas like rental or, or, or home ownership. Uh, some of the other programs like mortgage counseling, uh, we're all familiar with the downturn economy where we had all the default and foreclosure counseling. We look at how many people stay in their homes, uh, how many new generations come in looking for homes uh, from families that we've helped in the past. So we track data depending upon the program that's run here. And we use all that data to feed back to the funders as everyone said earlier, they wanna know, you know how many people are helped, who are the people are we helping, what are the income? So uh, in housing, it's very closely tracked. It's almost like a, a, you know, you're, you're a lender in a sense and you track all the information, all the census data that you need as well uh, to report out on. So, so it's, it's tracked quite well, but it's used mainly to report back and see and evaluate how the programs are running. Steve, I got to believe in the arts and cultural area, it's a little bit harder to track impact. Well, it, it's an interesting question because a lot of arts and cultural organizations, the, the number one indicator is attendance. Uh, did, how many people did we have come in the door? How many people participated in this or that program? And I, one of the things that, uh, we need to do as organizations is uh, be much more creative in how we're collecting the, the data, observational analysis, you know, hiring uh, independent evaluators to come and, and observe our programming, uh, conducting surveys uh, online and in person, um, running focus groups. Uh, really, I mean, I think it goes back to what a, a number of the panelists have said is, is really having conversations with our communities so that we're getting that uh, feedback to determine how effective we're being uh, and, and having that those ongoing conversations, as John was saying, we need to uh, not just know now what, but what, what's the long-term impact that, that we're able to have. Uh, and I think that's, frankly, that's been a challenge for arts and cultural institutions because they, they traditionally 
haven't really measured the the impact. It's it's been well. How many artifacts have we collected uh, this year? Uh, how many uh, people have come in the door this year? That that's been the traditional kind of uh, metrics, and and we need to, to, as I was saying, be a lot more creative. It'd be cool to really understand, you know, if you're a museum and stuff, and people are coming in, how many people has the museum changed their life where they've taken a new um, direction in terms of where they're going. So I, absolutely. And that that's that's just not that that's that's traditionally not been in the museum wheelhouse in, in terms of the you know what from an evaluation standpoint that that's not been a question that museums have asked themselves, but you're hundred percent right. It absolutely needs to be. And, and when you when you think about impact, I mean, you think about impact both on a micro and a macro perspective, you know, micro is how are you touching each individual person you serve or each individual person who comes through your, your doorway. And a macro is how you how are you impacting the community at large? So when you kind of think of impact, you got to kind of think of it from both perspectives. So let's jump a little bit. Um, you know, the uh, the pandemic has been like the biggest thing over the last two years. Uh, it's really changed the way everybody does business. It's changed the way that we think. It's changed the way that we interact with people as uh, exhibited by the fact that we're on a, a Zoom here instead of in person. So it's had a tremendous impact um, pretty much across the board. Um, you know, what are you guys seeing as um, things that have changed within your organization and how you're going to be doing things differently and you know, maybe you're doing them differently now. Is that something that's going to last forever now, and that's going to be your kind of you know next normal, or, or or what? So, you want to talk a little bit about how the pandemic has changed your organization and 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 what we're doing, you know, for what you're going to do from this point forward. So, Steve, we'll start with you. I think that um, the number one. Uh, impact that it made was getting the organization and, and the board, the staff to really view uh, museum work that, that we, especially during the pandemic, were first responders. Uh, I, I feel that there were many arts and cultural organizations that felt like they were kind of passive victims of the pandemic, that, that they were forced to close for six, eight months, a year. And uh, uh, they needed help, uh, but what we wanted to to do was say, well, we're we're not going to just be passive in this environment. We need we need to be first responders, and what what can we do to um, help our community? And and the the kind of silver lining in that is that the the community then responded and and helped us survive. So it was a, a kind of a, a mutually beneficial. And that has really been inspiring to, especially the leadership of the museum. And I feel like will be something that will carry on uh, once hopefully eventually we'll be past this pandemic, but that mindset will remain here at the Children's Museum. Heather? Yeah, I mean, for us, um, it was really a desperate situation for families. I mean, we, I would get phone calls, emails that basically said desperate for diapers. Um, what happened was a lot of families who could afford to buy a, a decent amount of diapers went out and bought them all, um, hoarded them on some level so that the families who really struggled financially, when they went to the store, there was nothing there. Um, or the box that was there was too expensive and they didn't have enough money to afford it. Diapers cost $80 per month per baby. And when you have a couple of children and you're a single mom, it, it's, it's a serious struggle. A lot of the local food pantries in some of the smaller communities, they had to shut down temporarily because, you know, staffing issues, illness, it was a, a whole related number of things. So basically what we had to do is we had to shift our mindset and we did it really quickly. Um, we started shipping via Amazon. Amazon had diapers. We had the funds to purchase them. Um, we get a, a discount through the National Diaper Bank Network and we buy business pricing. And so then we started shipping them out to families direct who came to us um, because they were desperate and they didn't know where to go and the local food pantry in their town was closed and they didn't have the transportation to get anywhere else. Um, 
so, you know, we shifted right now, we, we sort of do a hybrid. Um, we do uh, distribute direct to agencies directly who come to pick up diapers. We ship um, product directly to locations that are, are far um, from our hop hog warehouse, such as Steve out in East Hampton, you know, on Bridgehampton, you know, we ship um, the pallets out, out in that direction. And then we also utilize Amazon on a case by case basis. Um, when when fam when moms and families and dads and foster moms come to us direct because they don't really have any other option. Kind of cool that you're using the distribution network that's already in place to kind of make a difference. Mm -hmm. Peter. So um, as a disaster relief corporation, uh, we made sure our disaster plan was in effect for Sandy, right? And then the pandemic came, and I think it gave a different insight to us uh, as managers uh, of not-for-profits and executive directors of not-for-profits thinking that this is totally different this is a disaster that people are locked down basically in their homes all right so and you need to continue providing all services it wasn't just a temporary like a housing service because someone was flooded out and you need to move a family it was everyone was facing it so uh, initially, when the when the pandemic hit, uh, it was at more of a policy level to make sure that people weren't being evicted from their homes, that people weren't being foreclosed on their homes. And I think the more important at that point feature was making sure that people had a shelter place to stay in, uh, a place to stay in. Uh, where food became more of a priority and, and had the diapers and everything else. The, the basic needs became more of a priority. And as time went on, uh, and it lasted not only the, originally when we went out, we were all told maybe three weeks, four weeks, well, you know, we'll have, we'll have to clear and, and clear. And it went on to almost a year and a half to two years now, right? We're into. So if you didn't have a, a plan for your organization to work remotely, you basically lost the time to get those services up and running. And, and that's what really was critical. I think when we got told we were going down to 50% capacity at the end of the week, and then also we got told another day, 75% has to be out of the office to, to keep the spread down. And then by Thursday afternoon, it was everyone's going, we're shutting down, you know, you have to be out of your office. And it was kind of interesting because everyone worked together so that they started thinking, and this goes back to, you know, the staff, how they're going to operate their various programs within the organization and what they needed to run their programs. And we as senior managers had to make sure that they were provided those, those opportunities plus training. Because it's one thing asking for maybe a computer at home, but you know, how do I log on to that computer? How do I get access to, you know, the computer? But you know, you work very quickly, and you know, it, it, communication I could say is the best thing with the staff and with your clients. You know, how we, how are our clients going to get in touch with us? How are our staff going to communicate with each other? And how are we going to continue our programs to doing a different type of disaster or pandemic? So. Peter, quick question with the uh, the housing bubble. And the fact that the uh, housing prices kind of went through the roof uh, for a while and they're still uh, way up there. How does how has that impacted your organization and how have you adapted? Yeah. So when you see that someone's offering a cash uh, on the side for fifty thousand more, a hundred thousand dollars more, it just doesn't it doesn't float well with affordable housing because our, our families don't have those funds, our individuals don't have those funds. So you know we continue. Uh, to monitor through our technical assistance program, the, the units that are set aside for affordable with the private developers to make sure that they are occupied that, uh, for people that need them. Uh, we, again, continue our, our demand for our home ownership units uh, went through the roof because everyone was looking, basically, you know, can we do it? We did a whole presentation on this on Educane, but people were looking for more space and more space because they were working from home now, right? And they needed to have some kind of, they couldn't be in one room anymore or two rooms. They needed to be able to work, continue working during the pandemic and raising their family. And, and our demand for our services just went through the roof, whether it was for new homes, whether it was for, for counseling, for people to be able to go in and say, I have a commitment, all right? Because they couldn't compete with that cash deal when they're at the thing. There were 10, 15 people in, waiting to see one home through the real estate industry every time a home came on the market. So it really impacted affordable housing, uh, became much harder for someone to secure an affordable home if they didn't have one at that point, or if they're looking to you know, upgrade and expand for more space. John, how about you? How did, the, uh, how did uh, Viscardi pivot and change and what are they doing on a go forward basis because of the pandemic? We have a very skilled CIO 
who sees a big picture and looks down the road a ways and sees what's, what technologies are coming to us. Uh, and he had us ready to go to be able to convert our school to an all remote system on March 13th. Uh, we had one day of training for our, for our faculty and we were all of a sudden within 48 hours, we were all remote uh, and we stayed that way through the summer. We did a hybrid all of last school year uh, and we are now trying, trying to get into an all, in, all return to school this year, but re remote remains an, a serious option and uh, about half the students are back. But the faculty flexed, uh, there were no problems. We supported them like Peter is saying with appropriate training and supports uh, and whatever they needed, including how to operate their equipment at home. We would take over their, you know, our, our tech people would take over their computers and fix things for them working from home and be as responsive as possible because they needed help really quickly. What we found in the, in the sort of, the, as we were hoping that the pandemic was going to die down and we would all be back to work, that there was a, sort of a question of older workers wanted to come back to work and younger workers really liked the idea of staying at home and having a lot more control over their time and their schedule. And, and if their work wasn't time sensitive or wasn't a direct service to a person, why did I have, I, I, could, I could work at four o'clock in the morning. You know, I could get up and I could, I'm a night owl. Maybe that's what some people were saying. Let me just adjust my hours to fit my needs. And there was a great deal of pressure and input to having us uh, create more flexible human resource policies that allowed for those individuals who did not have to be with people as they were returning for services to be able to work from home. We have flexed in that sense. Uh, while we inc strongly encourage people to work at, come to our center to work, uh, we do for the certain jobs, allow them to work from home on a more flexible basis. And it's been, it's been an exercise for all of us to, to listen and, and to recognize that we're going to, we're going to live with this for the rest of our work lives. I'm pretty sure this is not going to, you know, when the, when the Delta and the Mu and the other variants pass through and we learn how to hopefully get back to a regular work environment, working from home is going to be a viable alternative or working remotely is going to be a viable alternative. And so we're just preparing ourselves for that day. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think what you're seeing out there is those companies that don't uh, provide an opportunity for people to work remotely uh, are going to get left behind. Uh, people want the flexibility, people want the options. And we're going to need to find across all industries, we're going to need to find ways to um, create some level of flexibility within the work environment. Because if we can't create flexibility in the work environment, we're not going to be able to keep um, the next generation of employees. Correct. That so, is exactly right. So that's going to be important. Now, several of you have brought up uh, over today's discussion technology and the fact that technology has become much more of a predominant factor in, in what you do. And, and there was a time where the nonprofit sector was maybe a decade behind the for-profit world. And I think there's been a lot of uh, closure of that gap um, from a technology perspective where the nonprofit sector is, is you know, catching up and catching up pretty quickly. Um, what are you seeing happening uh, from a technology perspective within your organizations and, you know, what have you done, you know, innovatively, or you think that's pretty cool from a technology perspective to um, kind of incorporate technology into uh, more of your every day? Who wants to kind of jump on that? Because okay. I know that's it. Go ahead, Heather. I'll go. Um, we are really fortunate. Our CIO, too, um, is amazing and set us up on Teams. And so we live on Teams. The Allied Foundation has its own uh, Teams chat where pretty much in real time, I can share with our board and, and, and our employees. We have over 500 employees as an organization, but I can share with the quick um, uploading of photos and a quick story. I can share the mission and the work that we're doing. So it's more inclusive. Um, the entire organization knows what we're doing and they're actively involved in it because I keep them connected in real time. Um, and we also live on Zoom too. Um, 
you know, and I think just to have those options available are, are a blessing because we do reach out to a lot of community partners. They don't have access to Zoom and I just set up a quick Zoom and then I'm able to see them face to face and we can talk about what's what they're seeing in their community and how we can work together to make an impact. So um, it works really good for us um, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Anybody else want to talk about how technology has kind of impacted? Yeah, we, we at the partnership, uh, first of all, we were required to have an annual meeting each year. So in order to do that annual meeting and, and stay in compliance with the you know, attorney general uh, requirements, et cetera, we had to do a annual meeting through Zoom this year and update, update the membership, et cetera. So uh, that it, it, it was really beneficial at that point because we were totally in compliance. They gave us special to change the law to allow for that during the pandemic, which allowed us to continue with our, our requirements of being a not-for-profit. Uh, but on our program side, we have multiple databases that were there. Matter of fact, uh, an interesting story, we had one database that we started putting in place years ago uh, through Salesforce, uh, Homekeeper. And then that program actually became very valuable to us to run some of the disaster relief programs, because as we were working nationally, we realized that some national organizations already developed the database and, and it were, was willing to share with the organization so that we could use it locally here. So uh, it, it brought us back a dual purpose, you know, a program that we had that was really only being used for a few programs then opened itself up to many programs here. And as we continue to, you know, try to streamline the database systems that we had, because at one point we had five different databases going on, depending on what programs you were running here, because they were required by the funder. So now we're trying to streamline those to make it more uniform across the board. Cool, anybody else? We just we just use it as a productivity tool as, as much as possible. And, it, and whether it, it's gizmos and gadgets that I need because I wear prostheses, uh, to be able to operate in real time as fast as I can, uh, my computer and on my phones and all of the rest that I'm carrying around, tablets, or if it's um, more process or systems uh, changes, we've elevated our CIO, Heather is, is complimenting her CIO, we've elevated our CIO to a, a chief level, um, so in, in the executive management circle we have 400 employees and we have about seven i think seven executive uh, level people um, we moved that person up because he happens to have a very broad view and a very strategic way of thinking and he doesn't see just narrowly you know gizmos and gadgets he sees the application of them the imp implication for collaboration and improvement and, and uh, productivity so you know he's become an essential part of our broader thinking and our strategic planning. So I, I'm, I think it's great, just really great. I was gonna say, even, even when you're dealing with the IDD population or um, the elderly or some of the other populations, the more that you can create that connectivity, the more that you can keep people engaged in a process and pe people engaged in society, um, through you know these types of uh, avenues, I think it's extremely important um, to to kind of break that isolationism which the pandemic has kind of caused. That's right. I I don't mean to jump in here. I'll I'll just follow up by saying I, you know, there is a bit of arrogance, and it's not intent, intentional arrogance, but it's arrogance on on the part of all of us who think that we uh, le we learn, we study, we we. Uh, receive words and images. And then you take a population of people who don't have the same physical or mental capabilities and they still have alternative ways of processing information and understanding what's going on. And a good IT person and a good professional in our school or in our building would, would be able to say there's another avenue, there's a new way of expressing and and communicating with individuals, whether it's through objects and, and language or symbols, it's, it's just finding that avenue in which we can connect with people who are different than we are. And so it's leveling it all out so that we can communicate on, a, on an equal and equitable basis. And yeah, I don't mean to, Heather, one second. I don't mean to focus on the, the DD world a second, but it's also, I think John, a little more than that, it, it's also looking at 
uh, how technology and how communication and uh, systems kind of fit into the, the overall service plan that's being created for each consumer that you're working with and incorporating that in from the very beginning so that becomes uh, a natural part of the process as opposed to something that's kind of used as a tool somewhere along the line, but it, it's, it's really part of the goals that are established for that organ that individual. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I'll, and I'll just echo, you know, what John was saying about, you know, people who are different from us. We have a lot of Spanish speaking families. I don't speak Spanish, um, but they communicate to me in Spanish. And so because of technology and Google Translate, I'm able to communicate back to them. And also, you know, having employees within our organization who are fluent um, in Spanish has been a life you know, saving thing for us um, because communication is key. And when you, when you don't speak their language, you have to find another way to make it happen. And if they call me, you know, it's more of a, you know, we text and, and, you know, however we have to do it to make sure that we're able to, to help them, you know, leave their stress that they're experiencing at that moment. Nothing leaves our building. It is not accessible in, a, in numerous ways to a variety of people, whether it be language like Heather's talking about, blind individuals, captioned videos, remediated PDFs. We do not send anything out from our, our organization that isn't as accessible as it can possibly be to the yeah, largest I mean, group of people. I mean, John is, is I mean, even, even things like websites and, and things like that, I know you have a uh, individual within your organization who's light years ahead of most people in terms of looking at uh, communication, looking at websites, looking at all of that, the PDFs, as you said, uh, pictures, everything else to ensure that your uh, communications are all appropriate for uh, multiple disabilities. So that's incredible. Right. They can choose how they want to receive the information. That's the key. And it's there. It's pretty cool. Um, we do have a question from the, the uh, audience. Uh, what aspirations do you have for the future? What would the organization like to accomplish going forward? Who wants to take that one? I'm jazzed up. I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm sorry, Heather, you, you want to go? OK, I'll just say one thing I really worry about in the nonprofit sector is that there aren't the same strong incentives economically to merge and to consolidate and create efficiencies that there are in the, in the uh, for-profit sector. And I think this is a little bit of a, a problem for all of us uh, because I, I think about, I'm the fourth CEO of the Biscardi Center. I don't want anybody taking over the Biscardi Center. I, I, I wanna preserve it. And, and, but I, I will look at another organization and say, gosh, you're almost out of money. Don't you have good programs? Don't you want those to survive? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be smart before you go down on your sword and fade away and your program, your good programs leave, wouldn't it be great to find a merger partner? And, and so we would, we would look for groups like that. But this is one of the issues that I have been looking at for the last 10 years here at Biscardi is why in, in the ups and downs of the economic cycles, why aren't there more opportunities or desires on the part of boards and, and executive staff to bring organizations together and create mergers and acquisitions? I mean, one of the things that we talk to organizations about all the time is, and sorry, I'm a baseball fan, so I'm going to take a baseball analogy. You know, when you get to the trading deadline, teams are trying to decide whether they're buyers or sellers. Are they going to you know, trade away their players and uh, or are they going to, you know, bring on key players in order to make the playoff push. Um, I think organizations need to be doing the same thing. They need to evaluate on a regular basis of, you know, are we a buyer? Or are we a seller? Are we in a position where, you know, when we, we really look at our mission and we really look at what we're trying to accomplish as an organization, are we going to be able to continue to do this in the long run uh, on our own? Do we need to strategically partner with someone, whether that be a full-blown merger whether that be deeper collaboration or whatever it is, I agree, John, that there needs to be a hell of a lot more of that stuff taking place. Anybody else wanna talk about um, kind of what they see going forward in terms of what really excites them? I mean, I'm, 
from, from my perspective, I'm all about building sustainability through philanthropy for our organization so we can exist forever. Um, and, and I say that because the need is there and we need to be there for the families. And um, I wanna make sure that, that we can be there for them forever. Um, and I, and I, you know, if I'm not leading the charge in, in you know, 10 years or, or five years, um, at least I feel like I've left them in a good philanthropic financial sustainability level where it can exist on without me. Um, so we're, we're building, we're growing, um, and, and I see a bright future for us. I, I would say uh, a few other things. I would say that, um, you know, a transition is really critical of the top uh, people in the organization that um, I think part of anyone's role, I feel my role is to make sure that you have a staff that's underneath you that will be moving up and, you know, reward internally if that's feasible uh, to work on selecting who the new person is, having the ability to train that new person early on while they're there with you and while you're there, I think is really critical. Uh, I think that partnerships not only have to be looked at maybe locally, but nationally. Uh, in housing, we have a lot of intermediate national organizations that get the funding in place, and then we, we all work together with them and they distribute the funding out to the organizations. And, you know, we have a lot more collaboration in that way because we meet constantly, we talk constantly, especially with the day of Zooms now. I mean, someone could be in California telling us what they're doing, or someone could be in D.C. telling us what they're doing. Uh, so I think I, I think there's a lot more of looking uh, beyond just what's happening, you know, here locally and, and with the organizations around us, just around us to, to team. But think big, think the bigger picture. You know, uh, think of ways that you know other people are doing what they're doing in their industry and are they successful at it? Because I'm sure you know you also learn from failures. Why did some people not do certain things? So you have to look at the failure side as well. But I think, you know, I think as a, a leader of a not-for-profit, you really need to take time to look at w what is around you as well. And, and that includes the collaboration and the partnerships. So. Yeah, I think that's important. The whole sharing of ideas and sharing of concepts. And, you know, again, I think, you know, it all comes down to continuously trying to get nonprofit organizations who sometimes work in silos to kind of come out and start working more together and talking to each other. And I think that's going to create natural synergies. Steve? Uh, coming from the arts and culture perspective, <clears throat> I think a lot of communities sort of perceive uh, arts and cultural organizations as a nice to have and not as a, as a critical, uh, absolutely essential service. And we do play essential critical roles in our community. And, and what excites me is how do we, one, make sure that, that we are doing critical work? And two, how, do, how are we communicating that? How are we making sure that our communities recognize uh, that if we were to vanish uh, at some point, the community would be devastated. So uh, it, it's, it's not something that I think people think of, oh, you know, if an art museum, if, if the art museum goes away, well, is, is it really, you know, it's, it's not like if a food pantry goes away uh, or if, a, you know, housing services go away, but, but it, it is. And, and we need to make sure that, that we're communicating that to our communities so that, that they invest in us and, and we're able to invest in them. Yeah, I mean, while a food pantry might feed the belly, the arts and cultural organizations feed the mind, which is just as important. Mm -hmm. So again, I think it, you know, you guys provide, you know, color to what could be otherwise a drab world. So, you know, I, I think it's really important for arts and cultural organizations to be around. So. Richard Florida wrote a great book on creative communities, which was all about the strongest economic communities in the United States have arts and culture at the core. And they have the smartest, most creative people in tech and business and in government working in those communities where it's led by the, by the arts and culture. So Steve, you are right on. Thank you. They're essential. 
When, and it's wonderful with our work I mentioned earlier in the Riverside community, the town of Southampton has had a number of efforts to revitalize that hamlet. This is the first one and we're, we're helping to spearhead it that they're trying to use arts and culture as a, as a way to reactivate and, and bring economic investment into the community. And um, <clears throat> the more we can do to communicate that and make other municipalities aware of that kind of work. I think we're, it's just going to, to mean the arts and culture is, is it, it grows and flourishes even more. That's important. Um, what do you guys see as the, you know, we're here we are in, you know, approaching the fourth quarter of the year. What do you guys see as the trends that are um, kind of emerging now that are gonna lead us into 2022? Anybody? More on technology. <laughs> Go ahead. I was just going to say more on technology. Technology that can help with records, document retention, data for your organization. Um, we see that a lot of the foundations now want backup on you know what's being done, uh, and they want numbers. Uh, every every grant we fill out these days require you know who our past participants were, history about them a little bit, and then. You know, it's much easier through technology that we could uh, collect that information as we go on through the year. So. I was just going to add that the fundraising issue is always right now so difficult. And, you know, going to online events and it, it, it's diminished our fundraising capability. But thank God we have donors who are accumulating and I guess everybody's accumulating money because they're not going out to dinners and they're not going they're just not spending like they are. And, and home prices are going through the roof, but so they're buying homes and causing Peter angst, I'm sure. But it's the fundraising and it's the new fundraising that's going to acknowledge that, 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 these, these, that, that there's another opportunity out there and how to maximize those. Uh, I still think people wanna do events, they wanna to get together, they want the human contact, uh, they want to see their friends and, and talk with them. So I think we're going to get back to that, but the fundraising and the, and the budgeting issues right now are really, really difficult because we haven't made up for it on the online side. It's good, but it's not getting us back to where we were. I think part of it is also looking at how to uh, maybe more effectively partner with your donors. You know, I mean, um, I think the days of, you know, one size fits all is, is kind of going by way of the dinosaur and we have to kind of figure out how we're going to more strategically partner with our business partners, how we're going to more strategically partner with, you know, the, the donors and, and everything else, because if we can find ways that we can kind of effectively partner, kind of pull it into the DNA of our, our donors, we're going to be in a much better position because then that money will flow. It'll flow on a regular basis and it, it'll be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, Heather, Steve, in terms of trends? No, I think I think you hit it. It's definitely data. You know, funders demand it. They want to know your impact and fundraising. I don't think that will ever change in nonprofit. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Um, it's, you know, I've been doing it for almost 20 years and it never gets easier. I think there's such a, there's a level of pandemic fatigue as well that, uh, it, it just, it's it, 2020 was, a uh, was, uh, I felt like as difficult as, uh, it was to manage a nonprofit organization, the fundraising culture, it, it just, it, it was, it was easier to just, as, as John was saying, you know, we weren't having events. So it just was easier to, to have people make a, a direct gift. Um, now it's sort of this kind of hybrid. It's it's not quite back to normal, but it's not quite the way it was in 2020. And it's it's a it's a challenging fundraising environment. Um, I, I think moving forward, we need to be more collaborative in our fundraising approach. Uh, there, that's been uh, also brings challenges with it. Uh, we we've tried a, a number of different ways to do that. Uh, here at the Children's Museum in, in 2021. And I, 
I don't think a lot of donors are, are used to it. So there, it, it raises a lot of questions for them about sort of how, how, how are the, how are the funds divided? What's, what's, what, what's going, you know, which, what money is going to which organization and um, you know, who, who's acting as the fiduciary and all of that. So I, I do think it, it going forward, it's going to be an effective tool for us to raise money because it means that uh, donors are going to see their, their, funds, you know, they get a bigger bang for their buck, but um, it, it's the, the communication to those donors is going to be essential. I think some of that also is, you know, giving donors a different view of what's taking place within your organization, kind of letting them uh, see behind the scenes a little bit more, um, using video to show impact um, through short videos. Again, I, I think it's, it's a matter of really changing how you approach fundraising where you know maybe it's not as you know as much the the big event going forward, even though that's going to be important to kind of keep people connected to the organization, but it's also again you know uh, letting people feel like they're getting that backstage pass, making things maybe a little more personal, and and really understanding what drives uh, a donor to give to your organization, and and you know how do you kind of continue to um, develop and build on that relationship. So. Couldn't agree more. I think targeted philanthropy by individuals, knowing where their money is going to go specifically, they want to they want to invest in a program. They may even want to name it there for themselves. But that would be great if they gave enough money. But they want to they want to see the change that you say you can create, and they want to invest in a specific program. So knowing what's going on not just in this general trust, we're gonna give money to the Viscardi Center because we know you, you're gonna do some good with it. They wanna go right to the program and invest in a specific program within the Viscardi Center. And, and you, have, have be, you have to be careful about that because you still need discretionary funds, you still need oh. administrative support and everything else. So you gotta kind of find that balance. Do you guys find that you're going to um, keep some level of virtual fundraising in your organization going forward after the pandemic, if the pandemic ever ends? Or um, are you guys going to really just um, go back to the um, bread and butter of, you know, in-person type events and do away with uh, virtual stuff? I don't, I don't think it's a one size fits all. I think we kind of have to be have a hybrid. I think we have to be creative. Like what Steve said, you know, we um, we're partnering with organizations to apply for grant funding together, because I think we'll have a better chance of helping specific communities of need. So, for example, we're working with an organization that's based in Queens, and they help about 1,500 people a week and families. And their need for diapers is literally constant. And so in order for us to sort of meet their needs and meet the needs of everybody else across Long Island, we're working together to apply for funding just for them to purchase diapers just for them to help the thousands of people that they impact on a monthly basis. So I think you've got to be creative in your approach. Um, uh, you know, never be afraid to talk to other partners and say, you know, maybe we can do this together because maybe we'll have a better chance. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And that's okay too. I always say we keep trying. Mm -hmm. cool. Anybody else kind of looking to keep this virtual thing going forever or not really? We're going to, we're going to probably keep it going for the near term and try to tie it into a sustainable recurrent source of revenues. So there's got to be some kind of subscription model or something that some of the for-profits are doing right now, but I think we're going to keep it going. I think, Ken, in the industry, um, you know, uh, fundraising is one aspect. Uh, you know, one of the things that we looked on early on, and I was working nationally with an organization to look at where you can get possibly fees for your services. So through some collaborations, there could also be fees for services that you're right. providing. So I think if you can spread and make it more diverse, your sources of income the best you can, whether it's fees, whether it's uh, contributions or foundations. And when one area has a lesser impact than, you know, all of them being, you know, just not being considered, I think you need to consider all revenue sources within the organization that you can. Yeah. Okay. 
John, you mentioned earlier at the, at the very beginning, you were talking about um, equity and diversity and, and everything else. Um, what have you guys been doing from a um, diversity perspective? I mean, obviously with everything going on in the world, I'm assuming you know, most organizations are more cognizant of uh, diversity issues. Uh, what have you been uh, doing in that, on that front? About 18 months ago, we created a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee across the three corporations. And we, are, we have stakeholders from all, all areas, from board members to all levels of staff, to program participants, to a student in the school, uh, and to suppliers, our, our vendors, who are, who are learning about the, the value of, of diversity and also learning the painful history of discrimination. Uh, and as a white guy and reading in depth the 1619 project, horrifying, horrifying what we have done to people, just horrifying. And yet we still keep doing these things with, with innocence, I hope, not with some intentionality, but you know, um, we still treat people poorly. And so it's really been a learning experience and now we're re going through our curriculum that we use in our school. We're looking at all of our programs and policies and procedures. We're looking at our recruitment of our board members. Uh, who are we recruiting and who are we letting go? Uh, and obviously in the staffing area as well. So it has, it's, it's transforming our organization to be a much healthier, open, uh, transparent organization. Great. Anybody else doing anything exciting around diversity? Um we, we started a, um, a RISE committee um, internally with, within our organization, really as a, an opportunity to have open discussions about um, um, all, all things related to inclusion and, and diversity. Um, and I think for us as a foundation, it's important for us um, to have on our board representatives who are indicative to the people that we serve. Um, so that is something that we are going to be looking at. We're going to be growing, and that's that's a big factor in in our growth for our board going forward. One of the things we did at the partnership uh, was we incorporated fair housing into all the various programs. Uh, so we did the same thing when we looked at our board, our staffing, our services. But one of the things that we did is our counselors who have direct contact with people to explain to them if they're discriminated against and to give them more information about fair housing. Uh, we also started training programs for, as we all read about, you know, the Newsday articles that came out. So we have a fair housing educator trainer that goes out and talks about fair housing and educates different groups in housing, like rental management, you know, companies, uh, developers, et cetera, about the fair housing issues and what they should be aware of. And also understanding the programs that are out there, you know, that you can't discriminate in, in Suffolk or Nassau County on income. I mean, that's an additional class that, you know, a lot of people don't look at, but yes, you cannot discriminate where the income comes from. So if someone's on a public uh, support service, they can't say no, or we can't provide the proper timing for them to have the house inspected, et cetera, you know, and, and and there's so many areas in housing. So it, it, it really has forced us to make sure that people were aware and educated on that. Okay. But just, uh, just to reiterate, I, I think one thing it, it, the panelists are really pointing out is that it it's, needs to be institution-wide. It needs to be on the board level, the staff level, uh, uh, the, the marketing level, program level. Uh, it, 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 it needs kind of to, to, to be integral to the strategic planning of the organization. Uh, it, it, it can't just be, you know, we, we put this, uh, you know, group together and they're going to make some recommendations. It, it just, it, it, everybody in the organization needs to be involved. Right. So we're running out of time. We have a couple minutes left. Does anybody have any closing comments they want to throw out? Anything they want to share with the group? Um, kind of parting shots. Honored to be a part of this. Thank you, Ken and Serenian and Associates for highlighting the work of nonprofits on Long Island. It is very, very valuable and very important. So thank you. And I, I would echo, echo that, Ken. You've been a strong supporter of not-for-profits. 
especially on Long Island. So thank you. And, and for the people listening, just be flexible and think out of the box uh, as it relates to your staffing, your operations, and your future directions. Uh, embrace technology because it, it's here. So it can help you in many ways. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, Ken. Yeah, thank you, Ken, uh, Serena and Associates for really giving us this opportunity. Um, and I just, if, if anybody wants to have a conversation with me ever, don't, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm quite friendly and uh, I will make time. Um, and I love sharing ideas and insights and perspective. And if I can be helpful for you and your nonprofit, I'd be more than happy to do so. Not saying I'm an expert by any means, but I'm, I'm definitely open for conversation and perspective. Yeah, somebody had reached out in the chat and said, how can we partner with this amazing panel? So, um, <laughs> so right there. Thank you, Ken and Serenia and Associates. What you know, being a, a the chief executive of a nonprofit organization is a lonely job. You don't have a peer in your institution, and so you know, even having this chance to to learn what other folks are doing and and kind of having that uh, interaction is just it, it it makes you feel less alone and 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 it. it galvanizes and, and inspires the, the, the work that we do. Okay. Well, I want to thank all of you. You guys did a tremendous job. This was definitely enlightening. I learned a lot and I'm sure everybody else learned a lot too. I just want to remind everybody that the applications for the 10th annual Imagine Awards are out. You can fill out the application um, at imaginewardsli.com uh, and you can apply in more, uh, can apply in more than one category. So hopefully next year, you'll be one of the panelists uh, sitting up here. So um, thanks everyone. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed it and uh, we'll be in touch. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.